I believe that we stand on the verge of a historic moment. America needs to fight a wave of your own kind where they can see you. Well, hey, how is it going, Rock Point Young and Alts? We doing good tonight? Doing wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm I'm doing pretty well. Um, I was told not to talk about this for too long, but my San Francisco 49ers are doing pretty great so far. Um, I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Brock Purdy, but he's pretty popular around here. So, uh, hometown hero, we absolutely love him. But that's the end of the football talk for the ladies out there. Um, but I just wanted to say, uh, man, I, I am so excited to be here with you guys tonight. We're going through an awesome series here in Young Adults called Rekindle. And during this series, we're really just going to track a lot of the revivals that have happened in history, um, why they're so important, and man, how can they still be important to us today? And uh, tonight, I want to talk about another hometown hero, but he actually doesn't hail from uh, Queen Creek, Arizona, but he actually hails from this place in England because uh, Queen Creek didn't exist back then. So, uh, but before we dive in really to anything tonight, can we just pray? Um, Come to God with just what we have, what we walked in with. I don't know what it is that you walked in here with, but um, I know life isn't always easy, and sometimes we need to just take a moment to pause. And so tonight, before we jump into any kind of content, can we do that? Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much for just who you are. And God, I ask that as we jump into tonight, that you would just teach us just even more about who you are. And God, we're just so grateful to be even be in this room. And I ask that as we learn about the life of a of a super awesome guy that we would also learn just more about you and how we can live more like you. Lord, we love you. Amen. Awesome. So tonight, we are jumping all the way back in a time machine. Isn't this what you've always wanted to do as a kid? History class, you have the best history teachers take you almost back into history. Tonight, that is what I want to do with you as well. So, if you can, please go into your mind with anything that you know about England in 1715. You got it? Yeah, no one. Okay, cool. So we're going to go back into this very, very small town in England. Okay, so does anybody know anything about what was happening in England in the 1700s? Anything kind of relevant around 1776 that happened in England? Yeah, America? Okay, so a a few years before that, there was this guy that was born, and and he's kind of going to be our main hero tonight. He's going to be our main guy that we're going to talk about and learn a lot from. His name was George Whitfield, and he was born in this really, really small town in England in 1714. Homie looked whack, but he was awesome, okay? I can say that about him because he's dead. So, um, and I, what was really funny is I was talking to my wife about this before, and I was like, you know what would be really funny if I just came up here and was just like, you know what, tonight we're just going to talk about an old dead guy. And then she's like, well, isn't that what all pastors do when they teach the Bible? Except for Jesus, old dead guys, that didn't land very well. I'll just keep going. So there's this guy named George Whitfield who was born in England in 1714. He was an awesome young man. He loved plays. He was so infatuated. Shakespeare was in Europe and in England, and he was going to be the next Shakespeare. So he actually skipped classes when he was little. Who's ever skipped classes? Yeah, the best part of school is skipping school. Um, So he did the same. He wanted to be the next Shakespeare. He skipped school, and then eventually he was like, man, I want to make a career out of this. So he goes to college. He goes to a college in England, and he meets two guys named John Wesley and Charles Wesley. We have two more characters in the story. So he meets them, and then they tell him a story that he's never heard before. Have you ever heard a story that you've never heard before, and it's just like the best story ever? Or like a TV show that you've watched and people are like, you've got to watch this show. You've got to watch this show. And then you watch it and you're just like, I'm so glad I watched this show. You know what I mean? That's, just what, that's what happened to George Whitfield here. Because John Wesley and Charles Wesley told him the greatest story of all time. And they opened it by saying that, you know, you didn't measure up. And that you fell short. But Jesus took your place. And walked him through the gospel story. And he was saved in college. A while later, because of how he was wired and just the way he acted, people in England were like so infatuated with who this George Whitfield guy was that they said it was almost like watching a heavenly display in front of you. 
So this is like, take the person that you think is the most animated human. Like body language, everything, always talks with their hands, and you're like trying to stop them to talk with their hands. Imagine that, times it by 10. And then the best communicator you've ever heard, the best TED talk you've ever heard, take that times 10. And that's who this guy George Whitfield was. He could capture your attention in a moment. He could just have you right here. And that's what this guy was. And eventually he came over to America. And I hope I'm not boring you with this story because it is going somewhere. But George Whitfield came to America in 1739. And the reason we're talking about him today is not just because he had a super dope perm and looked like George Washington. But he did something really cool that actually you probably wouldn't be sitting in this room if it weren't for George Whitfield. You might not have ever heard of him, but you're here because of him. He came to America and he started preaching. And he didn't stop preaching. And so many people came from all around, every race, every age, every type of person, farmer, all the way to businessman, to CEO, everyone came to hear this guy. It said that he would wake up at 4 a.m. and then he would teach at 5 a.m. He'd be done at 6 p.m. and then he'd do it all again the next day. And he did his ministry for 30 years and over 30 years he taught 30,000 sermons. And it impacted America in such a way that by 1750, 80% of America had heard him at least one time. So they didn't have radio, they didn't have TV, they didn't have cars, they didn't have Instagram, but he was able to capture 80% of the American people with what? What is this story that this guy George Whitfield stood for? It was the gospel. It was a story about how Jesus came down and he saved us from a sin and took our place on a cross that, man, we just, we just couldn't take. And then he rose three days later out of a grave so that you might be able to walk with him on this earth and in heaven. And for people who had never heard that story before, they lost their minds. It said his, one of his largest sermons toward the end of his life, he got 23,000 people to be there. And this isn't like when passion is a big thing or like conferences are massive, but something about the gospel gripped the people of America. And so he started the first revival. It went on for a few years. He ended up dying about 30 years after he got here. And his last thing that he did was teach a sermon and he could barely do it, but he prayed to God, God, would you give me the strength to do it one last time? And he taught, and he died a few hours later. And what it could be said about his life was not really just about how much he preached. And not just about how good he preached. But the word that they used about George Whitfield over and over and over, and I hope it's the word that will be called of you tonight after we walk through, is that George Whitfield Whitfield, was one of the most sincere people of all time. Like when you look at him, He had this faith and he had this persona of what it looked like to be born again and living with Jesus in a way that no one had ever seen it before. And and what I want us to see from his life tonight is just a few things that we can take from his message and from his life that I think if you apply it to your situations and where you're at, it's going to be able to give you the purpose that you're all looking for. Because I think all of us walk into this room And we all have asked the question before, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to do with my life? And everyone who's sitting in a chair right now is asking the same thing, whether it's you, maybe you have it, you might be asking, well, what's the next step? Or where do I go? Or or who am I supposed to do this with? But I believe tonight that every single person in this room has the same purpose, but it just fleshes out a little differently. And that purpose was George Whitfield's purpose. His purpose was to live his life in the gospel and to share the gospel, which I broke it down for you a little easier tonight. And the big idea is this. The big idea is to live the gospel is to share the gospel. Also, you can flip it on its head. To share the gospel is to live the gospel. If you've been a Christian for a long time and you've been wondering how do you evangelize, well, you just live like Jesus and he'll do it. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We are going to be in Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 5 tonight. So if you have your Bibles open there, or you can check out the Sky Bible up there, we'll have it as well. But what we are going to do tonight is walk through three different ways that you can lead and live a sincere, gospel-centered 
life. And those three ways are this. You grab hold of Jesus, you believe in Jesus, and you walk and talk like Jesus. In this passage in Romans 10, Paul is setting up so much in Romans. He's giving the biggest theological message in this, and he's giving so many illustrious illustrations. And in chapter 10, his goal is to get the people of the church of Rome to understand what salvation is. And I'll tell you this, if you don't understand what salvation is, it's going to be really hard to understand what your purpose in life is. Our whole eternity starts with our salvation. And this is where the rubber meets the road. So tonight in Romans chapter 10, let it start in verse 5. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart, who will go up to heaven? to bring Christ down to earth, and don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you have been made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So the first thing that I want us to see in here is that when it comes to grabbing this verse into your mind and when it comes to being saved and walking in your full purpose, you have to choose what to do next. You hear how to be saved, but this is where you have to make the decision. You, you have the ability with what God has given us to grab hold of of this message. And here's why I would explain it that way. Paul sums this up with what makes a person right with God. He's like, with salvation, that makes us right. How does that happen? Well, he says, it's very close at hand. And in Isaiah, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found and call on him while he is near. The first step, and this is what everyone who ever led a revival taught this very, very simple thing. That God is very, very close. And he wants to get to know you. And he is very, very near. But the first step is that you must seek him as well. God's always there holding out his hand to you. It's just that you must seek him as well. So the first point is to grab on to Jesus. And it's not just this weird way of just being like, okay, now I'm going to hold hands with Jesus. We're just going to walk through life. No, it's in different ways. You see the story where this woman is walking through the crowd and she touches the hem of Jesus' cloak and she is healed. It's not necessarily just being like, oh, you grab Jesus and you're fine. But it is if you're hurting, like all of us have. Or if you've been in a spot where you're like, man, I, before Jesus, I, I didn't know healing. I didn't know my purpose. But when you got a touch of Jesus, when you got a touch of heaven, man, you found it. Or sometimes for those of us who are saved and you're walking through this life, sometimes the touch that you need is you've walked on the water like Peter and you've started to sink. And Jesus' hand comes into the water and you have to grab it there. So when it comes to the first part of this, when it talks about how in the world are we supposed to follow Jesus and follow in an example like this guy, George Whitfield, and what Paul is saying here, we have to grab on to Jesus. Because without grabbing hold of Jesus, we miss out on one of the most important things that we can experience in this life. If we don't take a second and grab on to exactly what he is trying to give us, man, we will miss out on the grace that we can receive in our life. Like, I don't, I don't know about you, but I've, I've done some things that I'm not super proud of. And confessing those to people, I'm always hoping that, man, there's some grace. And... When God knows everything about you and everything that you're going to do, you got to hope that there's some grace. But man, as soon as you reach out and you grab God's hand, do you receive that grace? When you realize that, man, Jesus really is who he says he is, and he came down and he lived a perfect life and died on the cross and rose again, and then you can believe in that, and you don't have to do anything for it, and you just can accept it and grab a hold of that, man, like how, how good of a story is that? It's important because, man, if you, don't, if you don't do that, you miss out on the grace. And if you miss out on the grace, man, you miss out on an abundant life that God has for you. That he wants to just lovingly give you. And a purpose that he just wants you to walk in. 
living in this gospel that God has brought down from heaven to earth, saying that you didn't measure up, but now you can. Not because of anything that you've done, but man, everything because of what Christ has done. And you can run to him in your times of trouble. And you can put your faith in him when you are doubting. And you can c- come to him with every question that you have and he'll be there. I mean, I, I think of running to God a lot of the time. Like, if I was to go over to my grandma's house, and any time I go over there, when she opens the door, she's just like, oh, Hunter, it's so good to see you. How are you doing? And it's just like this warmest welcome. And as soon as I sit down in the house, she's like, can I get you anything? Can I make you anything? Have you eaten yet? It's just this process. I'm like, yes, everything, please. And she just serves me. And if my grandma can give me good gifts and good hospitality, how much better can my father in heaven do the same for us? And when you grab onto that, you're going to experience this grace that, man, you, you never have experienced before. And the reason we're dropping down on this is, is a lot of it, when, when George Whitfield taught, he taught a lot of the same stuff. But what I'm telling you today is, is it's not anything profound. It's not going to be anything super revolutionary. But what I want you to know is that if you grab hold of this gospel message and walk in it, you don't have to worry about what you're supposed to do on this earth anymore. You will already have it. So if you grab onto it, the second thing is to do this. It's in, it follows in Romans chapter 10. It says, believe in Jesus. In verse 9 it says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Jeremiah says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So let, let's look back and see what Paul said. So we said, a person gets right with Jesus by working tirelessly to be the best person they can. It doesn't say that. He says, a person gets right with Jesus by being just a little bit better than that other person. No. He says, a person gets better when they compare themselves to the others and feel like they're just a little bit better. No, it doesn't say that. It says a person gets right with God when they declare that Jesus is Lord and believe God raised him from the dead. Has that ever happened to you? Has there ever been a moment in your life where you have said, man, Jesus is Lord and I believe in him? For those of you in this room that have done that, do you remember that feeling? Like, wow, I really just handed over my life. What am I going to experience now? now? I'll tell you, for from, from being a Christian for a while, it, it's something that I don't think necessarily just happens once. <laughs> like, you are saved and you have this moment and you are forever in the book of life, but if, when you are a stubborn punk like me, you have to multiple times be like, Jesus is Lord <laughs> and I am not. What I really want us to get tonight is if we're going to live a really sincere life centered around the gospel and for other people, you're eventually going to have to go from Jesus just being your Savior, and you're going to have to go to Jesus being your Lord. Jesus can't just be good enough to save you. He also has to be good enough to dictate your life as well. And that's what part of believing in him is. And declaring with your life that you are his. That's what baptism is. It's this public declaration that I am a part of God's kingdom and I am going to move with God. I'm not going to go against him. I am going to be a part of what he is doing. So you have to believe in God in everything that he says. What does believing in Jesus mean? It means that no amount of anything that you can do can make you right with God. Only what Christ has done for you can make you right with God. And salvation is based on everything that Jesus did and nothing that we have done. And I'm pretty, pretty proud and thankful for that. The reason following Jesus is so important is because believing in Jesus is the only way that we ever get right with God. And I think so many times we we, we believe this lie that the world has sold us that if we're just a good person and make a lot of money and we give to some charities, man, we're going to be, you know, just just the brightest person. And we're just going to have the best life. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you believe in God and confess with your mouth, then you will be saved and you will be able to live in this life that God has created you because we're not a part of this world. The more things that you store up in this world now, you can't take with you. 
In this life, man, it is absolutely beautiful what we get to experience, but it is not anything like what we will get to experience if you take this to your heart. This is the first step down to heaven. When you surrender your life over to him, you get to watch him take you down a life of your wildest dreams. So first point is this, to grab hold of Jesus. Second is to believe in Jesus. Third is walk and talk like Jesus. In verse 14, it picks up and said, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. So if the goal of our life is to live the gospel and to share the gospel, then first we have to decide, okay, I'm going to take the sin. I'm going to believe in Christ. The next thing to do is you have to then go and share it. You have to be the hands and feet of Jesus, because who is going to know if you don't tell them? Who is going to know if we don't step out into that obedience? Walking and talking with Jesus and walking like him, man, it, it's going to put you in places and in, in, in scenarios where you are not like the rest of this world. When you walk down the roads that Jesus walked down, in the controversies that he took, in the stands that he placed, and you say the things that he did, people are going to look at you, and, and it might look different to this world. There have been some things that I've seen on the news recently that absolutely break my heart. And as a Christian, I feel like we have a job to do. And as young adults in this room, if I, I, I fully believe that if the people in this room don't do something about it, no one is going to. And the whole reason we're going through this series is because we believe that everyone in this room has the ability and has the purpose and has the calling to be the next starters of something really special. And the only reason I'm talking about this tonight is because I believe that there is someone in this room that will take this to heart and can start something. That there is a wholehearted devotion when it comes to someone who sits on their knees and prays to God and says, God, will you do it again? Will you do something like this again? Will you rally the people together? Will we be like what Jesus prayed? Will we unite everyone in love? Will we be people that aren't divisive? Will we be people that are inclusive, exclusively inclusive, and love on people and live in this life in a way that no one has ever seen before? We can only do that if you grab hold of God and you believe in him. But thirdly, you can only do that if you go. And if the places that you've been placed in and the places that God has told you to go, man, you, if you can't do it there, it, it can't get to this space. God's put you at your job and he's put you in your social circles and he's put you in places that only you can reach. I've heard it said before that sometimes you might be the only Bible that someone reads. So what gospel are you teaching? What if you never say anything to them? What are you acting? For Christians in this room, if you were to look at your life and look at your actions, what are you communicating? How often do you post about things that don't matter? How often do you have conversations about things that will eventually go away? I find myself in that all the time. As soon as the, like, one of my favorite teams win, my Instagram story goes nuts. Or as soon as something I think is awesome, my favorite band posts an album, I listen to it immediately. I know the songs by the third day, you know? I, I, I know these things, but it, it makes me wonder, like, what in the world is my purpose? Well, if my purpose is to live and to share the gospel, how closely connected am I to that or how closely am I connected to the rest of this world? Because I don't think anybody did something and changed something and did something extraordinary by just doing the same thing that everyone else did. I believe that someone in this room can do that. That you sitting in your chair today can be the next person that takes us into a season of absolute joy watching people turn to the Lord. And it doesn't have to be massive. Sometimes revival is just in your heart and that's all that's needed. 
I think one of the best things that we can do in our life is just ask Jesus how we can be more like him. So with everything that I've, I've said, I've skipped over some of my notes, um, but, but I, I want to sit here for a moment. I, I wonder what would happen in this room if you just prayed and thought and talked to God, what in the world do you really want me to do with my life? Like, there are so many aspirations and so many dreams and so many things that I want to do. But what do you want me to do? It's a question that I think if we really sit with and really think about and really contemplate, I think God will give you an answer that will be beyond your wildest dreams. And it's not something that has to be crazy. In, in, in 1 Peter 3, it says this in verse 15. I'm just going to skip to that. It says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because of you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. And I, w- I wonder how many people we could influence and share our hope with as believers if we would just ask for God to bring those people into our places and spaces. To live the gospel is to share the gospel. By grabbing hold of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, man, we can send out so many workers into the field. I believe that if we walk and talk like him, man, that incredible, incredible things could happen. But it first starts in our own heart. It starts with you sitting in this chair tonight, realizing that you are a sinner that needs a savior and that has one. And accepting that fact and believing in that fact and grabbing hold of that and then letting your life be led in that. And then when it comes to the part of sharing your life and and spreading the gospel, that's hard and that's difficult. But man, Jesus is right there with you. It says in this verse, man, what if people say, man, they're just going to look at the beautiful and great life you live and have nothing to say against it. I I, I think that if we all decided, man, I just want to be more like Jesus and and I just want to walk in this life and do exactly what he did, man, I, I think that we would experience a lot of crazy stories, a lot like this one. With George Whitfield, he, he brought these incredible crowds, and people flocked to hear what he had to say about the Bible and the gospel. People came from miles away just to get a glimpse of the story that he had. One of the stories is by this guy named Nathan Cole, who was a farmer and a carpenter. And he lived about 12 miles from Middleton, where George Whitfield was to preach on October 23rd of 1740. And as he was in his field working, he heard that somebody riding by said, George Whitfield's in town. George Whitfield's in town. So he dropped everything that he had. And he grabbed his wife and said, wife, we got to go. We got to get on this horse and we got to go. So they get on and they're riding down. And as they're riding, and remember, this is 1740. So there's not cars, there's not trains, there's not buses. They're just on horseback. So they're going to the town. And as they're riding, three to 4,000 horses are with them with riders, and men and women and children alike just piled on these horses go into town. And as they're riding by the town, they're passing all these farms, and no one is there. No one is at their work. They go by all these businesses, and no smoke's coming out of the chimneys. And they go through, and they see the boats, and the boats are going back, carrying people back and forth. And he gets closer to the town, and he sees the town almost like black. So many people are there waiting to hear what George Whitfield has to say. And when when he arrives, he says that when I saw Mr. Whitfield come upon the scaffold, he looked almost angelic in a young, slim, slender youth before some thousands of people with a bold, undaunted countenance. 
In my hearing how God was with him everywhere as he came along, it solemnized my mind and put me into a trembling fear before he began to preach. For he looked as if he was clothed with authority from the great God, and a sweet solemn solemnity sat upon his brow, and my hearing him preach gave me a heart wound. By God's blessing, my old foundation was broken up, and I saw that my righteousness would not save me. That last sentence, by God's blessing, my old foundation was broken up, and I saw that my righteousness would not save me. And with anything that I've said tonight, man, could that just be the one thing that we come back to? And when it comes down to it, we, we only have so long in this life. But would you let God break your foundations? And would you let Jesus just step into that gap where your righteousness and the things that you do and the things that you could do, man, it could never measure up. If it was up against your righteousness and his, you'd go nowhere except for the fact that in no other story ever has the hero given his trophy to the person who didn't deserve it. In no other story has the main character stepped out of the way and put someone else there except for them. And in our story, and in your story, that's what Jesus wants to do with you. He wants to shake your foundation. He wants to break your foundation. And he wants to become your foundation. And from that you can build your life upon, but you can't build it with your own righteousness because it'll crumble. But you can build it with his. And if you step into this life of understanding that, man, I can't do anything on my own, but I can do it through him, how much better would that make you feel? How much pressure would that take off your shoulders? There's so much power in stepping into that. So tonight, would we be people who live the gospel and share the gospel? That grab a hold of Jesus in a way that we need healing. And that believe in him that he really is who he says he is. Not just as our savior, but also as our Lord. And would we tell people with the way that we live, how we live, and the places that we live, that he is real and that he is doing something and he's gonna continue to do something. No one that we're gonna talk about through this series did anything too extraordinary to start. But what they did do is they said, use me however you want. And if you do the same, I'm not sure what will happen. But all I know is that God will be honored and that you will find purpose. So tonight as we close, just pray and ask God, God, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to step? How can I lean on you? How can I grab hold of you? How can I just love you more? How can I step into my purpose to love you and to live the gospel and also share the gospel? God, we are so thankful for this time. God, I ask that you would just be in it. God, I'm so thankful for everything that you've done. God, if nothing else tonight, would you just remind us how good and how awesome you are. God, whether it's through the reading of your word or the teaching of your word or the worshiping your word, God, would we just get a moment to feel your presence and to feel our purpose. Because God, we love you. We thank you for everything that you do for us. And God, would you do it again? We love you.